Thank you so much. I would also like to start thanking the organizer for this extremely stimulating symposium and for having me here again. I love to come at the Champolimu. I always have a lot of fun. Um, the work I'm uh, going to talk about today is the results of a, a long-standing collaboration with Christian Kiesers and, of course, a lot of wonderful people that you see there <laughs> that come to, to our lab. I think that if I show you these images, we would all agree that we don't just see them. So if we walk around Lisbon and we encounter a crowd of cheering people, unless it's a very bad day for you, you would immediately share the, 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 the emotional state of this crowd. And at the same time, if instead you see two people fighting on the street, you know, you, you don't just see them fighting, you see that you perceive the strength of the aggressor from the speed of the movement, the muscle. You can also perceive the anger or the pain of the guy on the floor. And uh, what we are therefore interested in the lab is trying to understand what brain mechanism actually allow us to have this uh, perception of the state of the other and how the state of others affects ourselves as well. So at the very beginning, we were working a bit in boxes. So we were, uh, you know, dissecting the, the scene into action sensations and emotions. And of course, we all know that this is not reality. Everything comes together and, um, as well. But I want to show you just a couple of examples uh, because they're quite important for what comes next. So at the beginning, we would just uh, invite participants to come in the scanner and show them uh, um, actions of like other people's performing actions. And then you can map the brain regions that respond to it, that you see here in, uh, in blue, uh, here. But what is the red? The red is basically brain activity that is involved in new performing similar actions. So now if we isolate the voxels that are responding both to you performing an action and seeing somebody else performing an action that you see here in white, you see that the overlap is quite big. But what is happening really in this overlap? This is an fMRI overlap, so everything can happen within a voxel, if you look at the neuronal level. So we could really be in this case, where you have neurons responding to the self and neurons responding to the other, but there is no actual overlap. Or we might be in the lucky case, where there is an actual overlap, together with neurons that respond to self and others. And of course, it's nowadays, I mean, you can of course work with the patients with epilepsy and get recording uh, from them, but it's not so common still. And so what we know in terms of neuronal responses comes from all the work, the past work that people have done on mirror neurons. And there, if you look in the homologue of these regions in the macaque, we do know that there are neurons that respond both to the monkey performing an action and seeing somebody else performing an action. And what I want to point out, if you look at these uh, rastograms, you see that these neurons don't just mirror, these neurons anticipate. And this makes sense because they are embedded in the motor system, which we know basically a lot of things that it does is anticipating uh, uh, our actions. And also now we know that it anticipates the actions of other people. And I don't have to, the time to present this work, but recently we also were able to record from the epi these epileptic patients and also um, have a high field uh, fMRI study where we look at the, um, the information flowing specific layers and we could really show that we do anticipate the actions of other people as well. And what about emotions? Because, of course, I started also with examples including uh, emotions as well. Here you have similar methods. You can induce um, bad odorants and disgusting uh, taste to the participants to map the regions that respond to it. And at the same time, you can show other people uh, reactions to a bad taste. And in this, by doing so, Basically, what you see is that you find, again, an overlap between you being disgusted, uh, for instance, and seeing somebody else in disgust, like we did for the action. And now I can go on and test pain, for instance, making like slapping you on the hand and then showing you somebody receiving a shock to the hand. And again, you would see an overlap between me being in pain and you being in pain. So you see here now the circuits include, most of the time, the anterior insula, and the anterior cingulate cortex. Of course, if you change the conditions, you also get other areas, but these two are quite um, common all the time and across, uh, across participants. And if we now go and try to zoom in and in the insula and we record from the patients, what we see is that there are neurons uh, in the anterior insula and actually all over the insula, and you see these are the black dots that you see there, the activity of which 
correlates with the intensity of the perceived pain. And here I also have the rastrogram of some of these, uh, of some of these neurons. So with this data, you would be very tempted to make a speculation. And this speculation is very simple, like, well, we share the pain of the other because we vicariously activate our own. But that's not exactly what I've shown you, right? But we can make now uh, a bit more uh, precise hypothesis. So are the same neurons also within the insula responding not just to the pain of the other, but also to the self? This is a bit more difficult to do with the patients because they are, of course, in pain themselves. They are in a, in a condition where it's not so easy to simply say, OK, I'm going to give you pain. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult to test. And then the other important uh, test would be, is the activity of these neurons of, or, or of these regions necessary for you to, uh, to perceive the emotional state of others? And for the actions, we did use TMS because the regions were quite superficial, and then we could show that if you inhibit the, 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 these regions, you also affect the way you perceive the actions of others. But again, because the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex are much deeper in the brain, these traditional stimulations, neural stimulation methods, are um, difficult to use. And finally, there is this common intuition that the sharing of the affective state of, of others is the precursor of, of empathy and also of prosociality. Is this true? And these are all questions that we are going to try to address by combining our human work with animal work. Because, of course, in animal, if you find a model that is suited for, for tackling these questions, then you have, as we all know here, a, a lot of possibility. And hi, we started with mice and rats, and now I'm, you know, after this week, I'm kind of almost converting to flies, because <laughs> you have a big number, <laughs> and we know that they can also share the state of the other. Um, and, but going to the other speci species, what, what I really like is the fact that it also gives us a possibility to study a little bit the evolutionary aspect, to, un to understand how old and preserved these systems are. Okay, this is, I'm going to show you the model that we use in mice and rats. It's very simple, and you, most of you are familiar with it already, so I'll try to be fast. So you have a, an habituation phase where two animals are placed in a cage with two compartments, and these compartments are separated by a transparent performa perforated divider, so they can hear, they can smell, and everything. On the day of the test, we are going to uh, give a shock to one of them that we call the demonstrator. And then, because in this environment they cannot escape, there is no way out, the only thing that they can do is basically freeze. Um, and that's what happens, and that's also the measure that we use. And this is the freezing of the demonstrator. So you see that at baseline they are fine, and as soon as we start giving the shock, then the freeze increases and soon reaches like an 80% level. So they freeze most of the time. And, but now the interesting thing is to try to see what happens to the observer. And if we measure freezing in the observer, despite the observer not experiencing anything, any bad things or any shock, you see that after a while it does increase the freezing as well. So there is somehow the emotional st or the, the state of the demonstrator is transferred and perceived by the observer. Otherwise, there would be no, um, why would, would the uh, observer freeze? And if we now include a pre-exposure session between the tests in which we teach, basically, the observer what it means to get a shock, and we do this in a completely different environment, and then we measure, we do the test again and we measure the freezing, what you see here is that the freezing of the observer now matches pretty well those, that of the demonstrator, suggesting that the pre-exposure, like the, uh, having experience of a particular situation increases your sensitivity or enhances your response to, to the state of the other. And interestingly, if we now rerun the experiment, for instance, and we take the demonstrator and we split them into groups, the groups that was paired with the naive observer and the group of demonstrator that were, was paired with the uh, experienced observer, and we plot the freezing, you see that there is a difference with the demonstrators that they were paired with the naive freezing less than those paired with the experienced suggesting that the information flow doesn't only go from the demonstrator to the observer, but actually it also goes from the observer 
to the demonstrator. And for many years, until not that long ago, these two fields of research were really separated, where when you would look at the uh, effect of the demo stress demonstrator on the observer, you would speak of emotional contagion, and when you would uh, look at the fact that the calm individual has on a stressed one, so this uh, direction, then you would speak of, bu uh, um, uh, of buffering. But maybe this is simply like the two sides of a coin, and we are talking of a very similar uh, mechanism here. And uh, of course, if we want really to be able to compare species, we do ideally, in the ideal world, we want to make sure that the circuit is also similar in a, in a certain extent, if we really want to use it also as a model for humans. And, um, and by the, the problem is that despite we have so fancy methods with mice and rats, it's still very difficult to picture the whole brain in response to stimuli that happen uh, over time. And uh, recently, people have started to introduce ultrasound uh, imaging, which is also based as an indirect measure of brain activity, similar to fMRI, so it's also based on hemodynamic responses. So, of course, you lose a little bit of you know, precision compared to the fancy method, but it can allow you to image the whole brain. And here, that is a very uh, recent effort in a lab to, to have this technique, and uh, it's thank a lot to Flor and Alison, and, and Chawi here, because they spent a lot of time in helping out. And um, so we have the, we image the, the brain activity while the uh, demonstrator, while the, sorry, when the observer watches another individual getting stressed. And here I'm only showing you one slice for now, uh, now of the brain uh, that is cut uh, at the height, basically along the ACC, because we were curious to see whether we, we can find in the, in the rodents really a similar, similar circuit. And here what you see are there indeed the, the responses to the shock to the other, and you see that you have a nice ACC response compared to the, the control condition, which is the shock to the grid. And here is just the direct comparison and the, the group results. So it is promising, at least now we have um, a mean to have a more direct comparison between the circuit that, um, in, in rodents and that, uh, and that in humans. So is it necessary to have activity in the anterior cingulate cortex to perceive the emotional state of the other? So the way we investigated this question was to, it's quite straightforward, we use a mucimol, which is a drug that inhibits uh, the activity of, of, the, um, of the anterior insulin, uh, the anterior cingulate cortex in this case. And then we run our test again. And the results are quite straightforward. So if we now look, plot the freezing behavior of the observer to which we injected saline, which is the control, then you see that they freeze as much as before. But now if we plot the freezing of the, of the observer that were injected with the inhibitory drug, then you see that the freezing decreased significantly. And this is a big, strong effect. But you should be critical and should, you should also be asking me, okay, but are you maybe just blocking the freezing behavior, like instead of the, the, the emotional contagion, maybe the, the animal cannot freeze anymore, because we do know that the, the cingulate is involved in, in also in motor output. So to control for that, we use, when we did the pre-exposure, if you remember when the observer experienced the shock the first time, we also played back a, a sound. So we conditioned the animal to this sound. And now we can just play back this sound, and you see in the dark black here, the animals injected with Nusimol when we presented the CS, they froze as much as before suggesting that the inhibition of the anterior cingulate cortex is not impairing the possibility of the animal to, to freeze when they are scared, but it more specifically impairs this transfer of emotional uh, states, so they don't react as much to the, to the distress of the other. And finally, we can also start recording from, the, from this region and see and verify whether we have neurons responding both to the self-experience and the observation. And this is what we did. In this case, we used heat laser uh, to stimulate pain responses, because of course, if you are using electrophysiology and you use the shock, everything, your signal is gone. Um, so these are our, our neurons responding to the self-pain, and the very same neurons respond also to the, the other animal getting the shock and being in this, this stressful situation. And if I modulate the intensity of the shock to the other, then the response is also modulated accordingly. 
And again, if we play this, the, the, this yes sound, then nothing is happening. So again, we have a specific response. So why rats and flies, because we know from the work of many of you, react to the emotional state, share the emotional state of others? So together with Marta and Evelina Knapska as well, we are proposing, so in humans, the, the classical theory is that empathy is evolved mainly based on the motherhood and, and the kinship. And here we, want, we wanted to propose something different, and I think it makes sense for many of you as well. So look at these cartoons. So the, the first animal here watches as access to information, the cat. And so, of course, it starts freezing because it doesn't want to get eaten, right? It just wants to escape. And what about this? This does not have access to direct access to the, to the danger, but he has access to the behavior of the animal. So now, by emotional contagion, yeah, now this animal will also freeze and save his own life. And now the, and the cat goes away, and then again we have the same things. The first one sees that the cat is gone, is relaxed, and then it buffers the, the, the situation for the second one. So what we want to propose is that the reasons why, or the, 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 the fact that emotional contagions may be evolved, simply to, to basically to understand and to sample the safety of the environment by looking at the behavior of other individuals. Okay, so if I go back to this example, oh, I'm running late, I did If I go back to the original uh, example and, and you believe my story, then you would be tempted to say, okay, now what I've learned from looking at this fight is that this place is dangerous and I need to avoid it, which many would indeed go away. But we also know that some of us would instead stay there and even help and try to stop the fight. Okay, so maybe this system that could still be evolved to sample, you know, to understand what's going around, can also, at, in, in certain situations, uh, still motivate you to stay and go and help. Is that so? So here we taught our rats to press two levers. And the levers give the exact same rewards. But one of them is a little bit easier to press than the other lever. And this means that very soon the animal will develop a preference for the easy lever, the easy to press lever at equal the reward. And now we play a trick. As soon as the animal presses the lever that is its own favorite, we're going to deliver a shock to the conspecific. And then we want to see whether this is sufficient for the animal to switch lever. Is it or not? Do you want to bet? <laughs> um, and in this, indeed, it does. So, sorry, here, if I plot the choices, you see that at the very beginning, they have a strong preference for one of the lever, and then this preference drops as soon as I start giving the shock to the specific. And this is independent of the sex of the animal. They do in, in both cases equally. But now, if I play the shock randomly, so that the shock is not a consequence of the animal pressing the lever, then this switch does not occur anymore. And what I can do, as I did before, I can in, in, uh, you know, inhibit the anterior cingulate cortex that we thought is uh, fundamental to perceive the emotional state of the other and see what happens. And when we do that, we you see, and this is the, the red curve over here, is that when the anterior cingulate cortex is inhibited, they don't switch anymore. Suggesting that this activity uh, of the anterior cingulate cortex that allows you to perceive the state of the other will, as a consequence, also influence your decision system. But what these animals learn? Do they simply learn that they don't like one lever anymore? Or they really remain aware, for instance, that, the, that something is also happening to the other? Of course, you can come up with clever experiments in animals that try to tease this apart, but the problem is that you cannot ask, so you don't really know. So we went back to human work. And here the task is relatively uh, similar. Basically, participants are faced with two symbols and they need to understand the consequence of what, what, what is the consequence of choosing one or the other. And then in one symbol, which we call the considerate symbol, when participants choose them, it will basically deliver a mild shock to the other, but it's not painful. And it gives you a little bit of money, but not that much. And this is most of the, most of the time, so it's a probabilistic task. 
And then in the next trial, you try the, the other one because you're still curious, and you see that the other symbol instead gives a lot of pain to the other and a bit more money for you. So we have a bit of a conflicted situation, and you have about 10 trials to understand these associations. And if I plot the choices of participants, the first things that you no notice is that participants vary in their decisions. So you have one th about one-third of participants that at one point, after the initial learning, they stuck to the, um, the more the considerate symbol, and then you have another third of participants that after learning, they decide to go for the money. And then, in the middle, of course, you never know what's, what's happening. It's a bit of a mixture. But what I'd like you to notice here, what I'm plotting now, is the choices of the rats in the previous task. And you see that there is also quite some variability between individuals, with some of them never switching and others that they do switch. So again, we have a, another striking similarities where you have these individual uh, uh, difference. And of course, what we, were, what we are interested in now is trying to understand whether people that choose, for instance, for the lucrative symbol remain aware that they are hurting the other. Or again, maybe they just learned that they like one symbol or the other. And to disentangle this question, we used reinforcement learning, and we came up with, uh, of course, several options where we have different uh, uh, values uh, for the others, for the self, and all the possible combinations. And we also have uh, a parameter that takes into account the individual preference, whether you would normally go for the considerate uh, or the, the lucrative choice. And when we do that, we see that the winning model is a model that basically tells us that we do keep track of both the money for me and the pain of the other independently of your preference. So you remain aware of what you're doing. And indeed, if I now ask participants as well to report the probability associated to both symbols, they are equally well, even for the, for the symbol that they didn't choose. They are a bit biased, but I don't have time to go through the bias, so if you are interested, you can come to me and, and, and later on. But the main message is that you do remain aware. And the last uh, thing that I want to show you is uh, of course, now that you have the model, you can correlate all the parameters of the model uh, with brain activity. And, uh, and here, I want you to simply focus on the fact that this region here, which is again the homologue of our anterior cingulate cortex, area 24 in the rats, is basically uh, correlating with the value update. So, with this, I hope uh, I... Uh, I convinced you in a way that we do have that, that the emotional state of the other, one of the mechanism, mechanisms through which basically we, we can be affected by the emotion of the other is by using in a way our own um, experiences as well and, 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 um, and the fact that basically this uh, system and I didn't have the time to really show the data here, but I know that it's very flexible as well. And it's really modulated by many variables. So you, you have a basic system, spontaneous system, that allows you to tap into the others by, in a way, using yourself to share the state. But then what do you do? Then there is a, a long chain of actions from there to, uh, to what you decide. And with this, I would like to thank all, all the people that uh, contributed to the human work in this case, in particular with Yoshi, that, uh, with whom we do all the patient work, um, and then all the people that work with the animals and the rodents and our collaborators in Delft that also help us uh, to set up the ultrasound. And uh, if you are looking for a postdoc, you can reach out and we can talk about it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>